Welcome to Faith on Film with Isaac Hernandez and Holly McClure. Keeping you informed on faith and family entertainment. Hello, Holly. How you doing? Doing great, thank you. And I'm very excited about the show today. Oh, me too, because you know how I feel about these thriller movies. Uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, at a panel that I was at some years ago, I, I asked producers, I, I, I told them, you guys should start thinking about making some Christian horror films. And I thought I was going to get kicked off the stage. But uh, nonetheless, it seems, by the way, I've changed it from horror to thriller because it seems Christians right. have a hard time with the word thr- uh, horror. But um, it looks like some movies are, since then have started to come out that are, uh, that are of that genre. Uh, and I got to tell you, today is probably one of the best ones I've ever seen. Not just Christian thriller, but thriller in right. general. And one of the most unusual. It's very, very different very from anything anyone has seen. Let's, let's take a look at the, at the trailer. Execution scheduled for 11 p.m. He's trying to convince us he's gone insane. And therefore incapable of being executed. I need you to prove he's faking it. Edward? I'm gonna ask you some questions. I'm not Edward. I'm a demon. Demons aren't really a thing. What happened to Edward? We own him. We? He's a master manipulator. You have your head so twisted around you think you're the killer, not him. And give me something to make him believe you. Prove to me you're a demon. Probably just a coincidence. I want to talk to the real Edward. Makes me do that. I can't stop him. I need you to see something. You got a fan. Did the same thing with all his victims. Help me! I'm trying to, Edward, but you have to answer my questions. You have to tell me the truth. It won't let me! It can go away. It can go away. Yes? What a great trailer. What wow. Great trailer. Yes. So good. And, and we have with us today the uh, screenwriters and uh, directors of the movie Nefarious, uh, Chuck Konzelman and Carrie Solomon. I hope I said that correctly. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome, welcome guys. And old friends, old friends. I'm old welcome friends. to your show. I, I, uh, I need to start off with this question. Whatever possessed you, no pun intended, <laughs> you, you, you like the way I brought <laughs> whatever possessed you to do a movie like this? I think the Lord works in mysterious ways. Uh, He's always used us that at the exact time he wants something out in the movies that uh, is apparently uh, going on in the world. That's when he calls us to go to work. That's when he calls us to get busy. And so in that respect, you know, when we did Unplanned, uh, it was perfect timing. Even though uh, we had the right to Unplanned six years beforehand, He then suddenly let us uh, start six years later, but it came out at a perfect time. And ultimately, I think it was responsible in a big part for the flipping of Roe v. Wade. Well, if you look in the world today, that, I mean, I think all of your listeners, all of your viewers would say that when they walk out their front door, something is radically changed in the air, in the world. You can feel this sense of evil. And I mean, it's undeniable. I mean, I feel it. Everyone I know feels it. Something is wrong. And it's that evil, the devil has, he's not hiding anymore. He's out and he's doing and he's frantic. And I believe that's because time is short. And so the Lord is having this movie come out at that exact time. If you just look at the, the synchronicity in this, pretty fascinating on an overall whole. 
when you realize this is the time that the, the Lord has chosen for this movie. So that's why basically we did it because he wanted us to do it. So we did it. And what response? I know it's already been out for a while and you've got some interesting critics, people who love it and they're like enthralled and then some who don't. But I'm not even really interested in the critics because you're always going to get that. What is the public's response? Have you had any personal letters or any feedback, how it's affected audiences? Tons and tons. Uh, for some reason, this movie has some particular anointing on it that when people watch it, they can't stop thinking about it. Two, three, four, five, six days later, they're still thinking about the movie and the issues that come up. And it's very, and that's both believers and non-believers. Uh, for believers at a certain level, it kind of functions as uh, scared straight for Christians. Uh, for non-believers, they start questioning their non-belief and wondering if there aren't uh, other answers to the big questions than the ones that they've traditionally held. It just doesn't leave them alone, uh, which I think um, C.S. Lewis kind of touched on this. I think when he was writing about his screw tape letters, he said, look, if you allow your to consider the existence of demons, uh, it can very quickly lead you to a belief in God. Because if you believe there are demons, which are fallen angels, you'll probably realize that there are other angels that have not fallen. You'll probably believe that some being had to create both sets of those, and that that creator God is probably good in his nature. Otherwise, the bad guys being very de devoted to their badness would have been in charge a long time ago. You know, one of the things that I really liked about the movie, and there was a lot that I liked, but was the fact that you tied uh, a lot of the whole demonic thing to things that are happening in our culture right now, things that sometimes people just kind of think that, oh, you know, it's just how, how the world has evolved right now, uh, like abortion and, and the whole transgenderism and all that. But you tied it to the fact that it's really the devil that has his hold on this and is really is the one that's creating all this. Uh, really appreciate that. It was, uh, why, you know, why, why did you feel you should do that? Well, I mean, we're devout believers, uh, <laughs> number one. We felt called by the Lord to do it. I believe that what's going on now, I mean, unless you're not paying attention, this is evil. And I think, uh, you know, abortion, euthanasia, uh, a multitude of other things. I think the whole woke agenda. I mean, everything, you know, what's happening to children now. I mean, this is abhorrent to God. And I think that the Lord brought this forth for this exact reason. Um, you know, but one of the things I'd like to say about the movie, because those people who have not seen the movie, you start off with the trailer and uh, the trailer itself is scary. The poster is scary. I want you to know that Chuck and I would not go to see this movie had we not made it. And what I mean by that is when I look at the trailer, I'm thinking, oh, this is one of the <laughs> demonic, satanic movies, right? Well, we did not do it for that reason. We made that trailer and the poster so that non-believers would be drawn to it like a moth to the flame. So the movie does not have any sex. It does not have any F-bombs or language. It doesn't have any demonics, no satanics, nothing near the poster. It shouldn't even really be rated R. Our poster was designed by Jason Pearson. Jason Pearson did the poster for The Passion of the Christ. Oh, I love that. I love that. Wow. He's a total sold-out believer for Christ. This was all done with the intention of bringing people in who who were tempted to go to horror movies mm -hmm. and stuff. One of the faith reviewers who saw the film said, oh, when he, he came to our premiere, he said, this movie is like a theological drive-by shooting in a good way. You get the audience in, they sit down in that chair, and they're not prepared for the faith conversation that's about to take place in front of them. And that there, the way the film is designed, most of it takes place literally over a table between a demon and a person who's an atheist, and the audience is the unseen third person in that conversation, watching at extremely close range, and we get pulled into that conversation as the viewer. And what I love, though, too, is, and thank you for not putting the GDs, I know you guys wouldn't, but everything you see these days has some language or something, and this really doesn't. But like you said, it pulls in that younger demographic, too, the 20-something to 30, 40-something-year-olds that go see those horror films, especially the 20-somethings, and I think that's amazing. I, I like that. We won't give too much of a way, but in this, it's not just a conversation. In the course of this, you know, what a doctor attorney coming in to ask him questions, you know, he ends up telling him, before you leave this room, 
you're going to, you're going to do three things, you're going to murder, you're going to do, I mean, he really, and you're thinking, well, now wait, so it compels you to stay with it because you're like, well, wait a minute, how is he going to do that? You know what I mean? So I, the way you wrote it is brilliant because it really pulls you along and pulls you along even to the very end, which we won't give away, but that's, I love that. I, I love that too, as well. Mm -hmm. Well, we appreciate it, but I, I would like to take credit for writing. So would Chuck. However, we're two guys from Jersey, and I can assure you we can't write or even talk like that. That was the Holy Spirit. That, that All praise goes to God, I'm telling you. You know, he was with us. He told us what to do, where to go. The Lord and, chooses some strange vessels, and in this case, we were them. You know, so, but we're just two dumb guys from Jersey. We just happened to say yes. <laughs> well, I, okay, I'm, first I'm, of all. Go ahead, First of go all, ahead. you're not too dumb, you're not too dumb guys. You did got you wrote God's Not Dead, the first one that went amazing right. and was a big huge seller. Um, do you believe? I mean, I personally was on the behind the scenes for a couple of the films. You so you're not dumb guys. Trust me, I love your writing is brilliant, and everyone who sees this movie will think the same. Yep. Well, we appreciate that, but again, we give the praise to the Lord. You know, we try to be humble. Um, what I can say is I believe the movie is anointed. And I think it's important that your audience also knows, by the way, the Bible says very specifically, if you want to know the heart of a man, if you want to know what he what he is, look at the fruit of his tree. Mm -hmm. and, and if a good fruit, good man, bad fruit, bad man. You look at the fruit of our tree, it's God's not dead, God's not dead, do you believe, what if, unplanned, this movie, uh, and other stuff as well. I mean, I think that's good fruit. So I want your audience to know we would never betray br fellow brothers and sisters in Christ yes. by tricking them into the theater to corrupt them or have demonic, satanic crap. That is not what we would do. We would not go there. We would not offend our God. Ironic. We would never blaspheme. It's not demonic and it's not satanic. And like you said, it's two guys in a room. It's C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, an adult version meets Silence of the Lambs. And and that's really that's really what it is. There's nothing to be scared of. Ironically, this is the movie we've been asked for by a lot of Christians for the last ten oh, years. Yeah. That these the, yeah. because we are told over and over again, I cannot take my family member who's walked away from the faith. I cannot take my non-believing cousin or friend to a movie called God's Not Dead or Do You Believe or or anything like that. So please give us a movie that works as a normal movie where we can take them in. There's going to be uh, some faith in there. And afterwards, we can have a conversation. But they don't feel like they've been preached to uh, for the last hour and a half. So this is that movie. Now, ironically, yeah. the, by virtue of being able to do that, the packaging looks like the world's packaging. And that's OK. But the, the key is to get past that initial fear to go in. And so many people were hearing over and over again, I was afraid of it. I didn't want to go to it. I was concerned about what I would see. And I watched it and I came back and I loved it. And people are seeing it over and over again. So that's that's, yep. that's what we're seeing. Really cool. I, I've been, of course, uh, singing your praises since I learned of this movie about a month and a half ago or so. Uh, so whenever you post or somebody post or, you know, there's something about it, I share it, I like it, I comment on it. Uh, and recently there was a lady that said, oh, I'm not going to go watch this because there's enough horror in this in this world. Um, and I just commented back and I said, look, this is not what you're thinking. And I explained to her what the movie really was like. And I said, I, you know, I, I'm somebody that doesn't like horror movies, but I absolutely love this movie. And in fact, I brought my kids in to watch it when I was screening it. And they're very critical of Christian, what I call dog and pony movies. Um, and they really love this one. Now, when I made that comment, then somebody else said, well, maybe they should think about their marketing. And my response was, and, and you, alluded, uh, you alluded to that just a short while ago. It was, I said, it, I'm sure it was specifically designed to capture those that are not the Christian market, but the ones that really need to see about this as well. So, so you are brilliant. You're, again, as Holly said, you're not too dumb, guys. You are brilliant. All that was just brilliant moves. Uh, now, I love everything about it, including the actor that played the, the possessed guy. Oh, my gosh. He was amazing. Holly? No, I was going to say, and let's talk about him because, I mean, first of all, tell who tell the character was that played Edward, and and the fact that he so was two completely different actors, characters in one man, and, and what he embodied, uh, that the script that he had to memorize, the things that he had to do, it must have been yeah. exhausting. But wow. Well, I'll tell you. First off, that Sean Patrick Flannery, he was Boondock Saints. Uh, he was young Indiana Jones. He was in a movie called Powder. He's been in 
more more movies and TV shows than anyone here can count. I can't count that high. Uh, but uh, fantastic worker. But what blows our mind, by the way, he's totally dyslexic. Wow. So here's a guy. Every word gets committed to memory. Every word gets committed to memory. Wow. Not on the day of shooting. He commits it to memory well ahead of time. And is just so, completely familiar with it. And when memory. you get a script like this, I mean, every page is dialogue in this script. So it's yeah. not like we're cutting to a building blowing up and then airplanes flying in and lots of explosions. None of that in this movie. There's two guys sitting in a room. Now, I know that sounds boring. Trust us. It's, no. not, it was it's never boring. We're getting people that call us up and say, you owe me 10 bucks because I went out and bought a large popcorn and a large Coke and I never drank the Coke and I never got to the popcorn. So basically... Uh, we know that it's not boring. We haven't had one person say it was boring. But Sean is, in our opinion, mm -hmm. I, and I say this and people say, come on. I'm telling you, he's the best actor in Hollywood. His skill set is just off the charts. We've worked with a lot of actors. I can't. Uh, he's in first place and there is no second. He's just so good. He's just so amazing. And as a professional, he's not a diva. He's a real guy. He's a real man. He loves the Lord, family, loves his sons, loves his wife. He's, a, he's a, you know, in Texas. Five seconds after you call cut, he's a normal human being again, which is really pleasant, by the way, as a director. Uh, <laughs> Especially in those intense scenes, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. He, he reverts to being a normal human being very, very quickly, and that's that's very, very reassuring. And we tell people all the time, you know, first day, I think it was 17 pages, he said, uh, he rattles off a 17-page sequence with Jordan Belfi, which is the psychiatrist across from him. And those two guys do it in one take, straight through. <gasps> what you saw was one take. Yep. That never, ever. Wow. No, yeah. Most of your viewers yeah. are not in the movie business, obviously. That's like yeah. constructing a skyscraper in a week. Yeah. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. I figured we'd be done by 5 o'clock that day, and, and, and the movie was done. At that rate, you know, I just let them go for four or five more hours, and we shoot the whole movie in a day. <laughs> we had incredible obstacles shooting this film. One of them was we were struck by the unions on day four, and they tried to get the federal government to shoot us down. When we actually got up and running again a few days later, uh, because we we defied that strike. Uh, we just said, we threw our shooting plan out the window. We said, we're going to put a camera on these guys acting. We're going to shoot until the wheels fall off. We have no idea how long that's going to be. And 17 pages later, they reached a good stopping point. And literally, we just moved the cameras for different coverage. And we took that same 17 pages half a dozen times. And we got two days worth of shooting in one day. And uh, both these guys are amazing, amazing actors. And the Wharton was great, too, Tom Omer. Uh, uh, all three of these guys, you know, they carried the movie. I believe Sean should win the Academy Award. Now, due to political bias and Hollywood being woke and hateful of Christians and of the Christian message, I don't think there's a chance other than if the Lord says, watch this, in which case it'll happen. But he deserves, I defy anyone to sit in a row or come on your show and I will debate with them. They can show me who they think should be best actor. And I will tell you, it's not even close. He is so good in this movie, they should move the Oscars up and say, we're passing next year, which is going to give him the Oscar now. Stan <laughs> <laughs> Emeritus of one of the big three theater chains saw this film before its release. And he said, um, you have a dark, heavy masterpiece. He said, yes, we will book this film. Uh, we will. We want this film. We want it in a big way. And his favorite actor of all time is Anthony Hopkins. And he said this performance is on par with Anthony Hopkins in Silence of the Lambs. And that's, wow. That's pretty hard phrase. Yes, it is. Wow. Big compliment there. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about that. I'm wondering how, you know, um, the fact that they, I was going to say, did you get any um, satanic, uh, you know, things happen or any oppression or anything uh, 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 that uh, uh, kind of cause division? Because well, when you're done, well, like let's, this, just start off, let's just start off with this. There's a phrase that we were told a long time ago, and it's the most applicable phrase I defy any atheist, any person, anyone in the world as we know it, ask yourself this question and you will find out whether or not there is a devil and thereby if there is a God. We were told if you don't believe in the existence of the devil, declare war against him and see what happens. That is exactly what this movie did. That's why your viewers should not be fearful of it. But what is about to, what I'm aware about to describe to you is a little taste of how much the devil doesn't want to be pulled out of the darkness and into the light, which is what this movie does.
Well, we've been working on this film for several years. I'm going to confine things to the last month or we'll run out of time. Uh, right around the first week of April, the building we were in running our marketing campaign, the entire roof got torn off uh, during the rainstorms in California. By the way, big building. We're not yeah. talking small building. Big wow. building. Only, the whole roof. Only building in Burbank this happens to. It happens 2 or 3 a.m. as best we can tell on a Saturday morning, meaning no one will discover it for about 8 or 10 hours. It's turned two stories worth of building into an indoor water park by that time. All the carpets have been taken up. All the drywall needs to be torn out. It goes down the sticks like a post-Katrina rebuild. So we're, we scatter hither, thither, and yon. There were only two things going on in that building, post-production for The Chosen and our marketing campaign. Wow. Uh, on the, at the premiere on the flight home, uh, well, we'll start before the, uh, before the premiere. Uh, we're doing interviews. Holly, I know you're familiar with this process. Sound mixing goes bad. Hard drives are getting corrupted. Uh, lights start flickering. We have Carlos <laughs> Martins, who's the host of the Exorcist Files podcast. We call him back. His interview was already done, but they got hit, the files got corrupted. He says, I know what this is. He starts a Latin right exorcism of place. He's going through, and he's on the fifth floor with his back to a balcony. No one out there, but he hears a woman's voice chanting in his ear. In the language you can't quite discern, but it's very clear that she is chanting. No human being can be where that voice is coming from. Because we're on the fifth floor. Until he gets to the point of the right where he says, bow now before the great and te- before the holy and terrible name of Jesus. And then it stops. On the night of the premiere. Whoa, we- whoa, whoa. Stops. The lights stop flickering. All the electrical equipment starts working. Oh, yeah. my gosh. So he did an exorcist. He did an exorcism in the room. Yeah. And drove out the demonic spirits that were in the room. Eight car crashes in 11 days. No one got hurt. Cars all wow. total. No one got hurt. So the devil attacks. The Lord defends. He wants it to be completed. Our producer. Saturday, he, Chris Jones. Just this Holly, Saturday. I believe you probably know. Uh, he was putting his bit. This is Saturday, two days ago. He's strapping his baby into the car seat of the family car. He leans back into the vehicle because the child's foot gets stuck. As he leans in, two inches behind him, an SUV at 45 miles an hour rips the door off where he just was, totals his car. A matter of three, four inches, he would have been dead. Yeah. Uh, the, oh author, my gosh. the author of the book, A Nefarious Plot, that inspired the thing, he's been hospitalized twice in the last two weeks with a mysterious MRSA infection out of nowhere. Just out of nowhere, infection in his blood, almost dies until everybody is praying over him in the hospital. He he makes it. During shooting, our exorcism trained priest who was staying at the same B&B house with us gets rushed to the hospital uh, for an emergency appendectomy. The, app- the appendix bursts during removal. The surgeon told him if he got there an hour later, he wouldn't be alive. During the day that we're shooting a scene about discussing the devil and how he how he operates, we have what we were told was the highest sustained winds in the state of Oklahoma. We had 70 mile an hour sustained winds. Well, that meant that the building we were shooting was groaning. The metal HVAC, the girders were groaning. Sounded like we were in hell. Yeah. And actually, um, but every time we're shooting about the devil, when we stop shooting about the devil, the building is fine. Start shooting again, it's like when hell. The atheists, the non believers that are in the crew look up and can't believe it and say, it's like we're in hell, okay? Unbelievable. We are in our house in Oklahoma. The priest is saying with us, we have the ministry team, the evangelicals, uh, the ministry team for them, the priest, we have uh, the priest for the Catholics. An animal comes down the chimney of the house. While we're gone. Now you're gonna think I'm making this up. This cannot be made up. My son comes out to the house for Christmas. So I decorate the mantle and, and, the, and the living room. I got Rudolph, I got Frosty, I've got the baby Jesus, the nativity, Mary and Joseph, Jesus, the whole thing. Uh, ornaments, everything, we're Christmas stuff. An animal comes down the chimney, pushes open the doors, gets up on the mantle place, doesn't destroy Rudolph, doesn't destroy Frosty or the toy soldiers, but destroys by knocking over, which is in the middle. So it had to go around everything else. Goes to the baby Jesus, knocks it off, and it breaks. The, the crib, Mary, Joseph, Jesus, all the holy items, all the true power, not secular symbols. So then he goes from there, and the priest had an altar in the house for the to do mass. On the altar cloth, the we believe it was a squirrel, which is insane, jumps up onto the cloth in the top right and the bottom left, urinates on the altar cloth. 
then goes to the center of the cloth where there's a golden pattern, which is the, is the plate where the Eucharist, the body of Christ, is on that plate and desecrates the plate by defecating on the plate. Yeah. Food all throughout the house doesn't touch any food. Now, remember, this is a squirrel. We're talking then snacks, goes back out on the counter. Yeah. Goes back out and into the fireplace and up out of the house. Wow. wow. Unbelievable. After premiere on the flight home, the short flight from Dallas to Phoenix, our, our booking agent, who was our key marketer, this is the high point of his involvement. His eardrum perforates. You know, we got to do a making of on this. This is you really you, know, you have to. You have to. You have to. I mean, every electrical device, every cell phone. Okay, we go into buildings to have the movie tested. I'm talking buildings the size of a square city block. Deluxe. Okay. Bam. You guys know deluxe. All we, we're industry. putting it on, ready to go. Bam. The electricity knocked out. Every wow. building we go in. Bam. I go to the office depot to buy yellow pads. Yellow pads. <laughs> we get to the door and the guy says, can't let you in. And we really needed them. We were doing notes. I really need them. We were going on a long journey. And the guy says, I'm sorry, the electricity just went out. We can't let you in because we don't have any way for you to pay. Now, you wait, wait a second. The office depot. If you yeah. Were, you know, we had to take our, our Newsweek interview had to be taken three times. The equipment malfunctioned after half hour interviews twice. And that equipment was 3,000 miles away. Newsweek has real equipment. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. With the tape, there was nothing on the tape. Yeah. So they send us an email. We fill out the question. We do the questions they by say, email. Let's do it in writing. So, okay. so Chuck is doing, he answers the questions. We're sitting together in the place where we go for breakfast every day in a diner. Okay. And what happens? He can't send it. I'm sending, I'm two feet away. I'm sending emails like I'm a wild dog. Boom, boom, boom. He sends other emails, not a problem. Can't send that email. Took so I said, minutes. you know what? I said, wait a second, wait a second. We're idiots, okay? Let's just pray. Ask for protection. We pray. Oh. <laughs> Unbelievable. G gentlemen, we have literally run out of time. This is the fastest show we've ever done, Holly. I, it just oh went gosh, like that. I want, to, I want to keep going. There's so much I, more we didn't talk about. I, so I, I know, but, but there's there's just one quick question that I want to want to bring to you, and that is knowing all, everything that you've gone through, everything that you've experienced, and I think I know the answer to it, but I want to hear it from you. Would you challenge the devil and do this again? We wouldn't challenge the devil because we think that's foolishness. Mm -hmm. But, but we'll would you do this again? Yes, we would absolutely do it again. Yes. If, he, if right. the devil hates it this much, the Lord has a real purpose. Look, for we went okay. through this in right. unplanned, and then the Lord said, do it again. Well, I want right. you to go do it in a far. Right. Look, our life is committed to Jesus. That is well, what I, don't, I don't think you have to do it again because you know what? This <laughs> one is going to do what Satan didn't want you to do, and it's going to go beyond. So, congratulations, yes. guys. Yes. This was an incredible interview. Thank it you was. so much coming out with us to talk about this movie, Nefarious. Yeah, I hope you get it and I'll see you and your viewers. You bet. Folks, see you next week. Write to us at faithonfilmtv at gmail.com. That's faithonfilmtv at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at faithonfilmtv. Also, go to our YouTube channel, Faith on Film TV, and hit the subscribe button and the bell for notifications on our latest Faith on Film shows.